The following program is brought to you by Whiteman TV. All content in the Stay Strong, Live Long Falls Prevention Education Series has been created for informational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health care provider with any questions you have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this television production. Welcome to our Stay Strong, Live Long Falls Prevention Education Series, brought to you by the VON, the Upper Grand Family Health Team, and our community partners as well. I want to start off by saying that falling is actually the leading cause of injury-related deaths among our seniors and the number one contributor to loss of independent living. In fact, one in three seniors 65 and older will fall each year and falling just once can double your chance to fall again. It is our hope that through this Whiteman Telecom production that we can change these statistics in the County of Wellington by empowering our community with the knowledge and the tools that you need or we need to prevent future falls. Today's session includes the topic of medications, medication uh, use and misuse perhaps, and this is brought to you by Cora Van Zutphen. She is our pharmacist with the Upper Grand Family Health Team. Welcome, Cora. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Julie, for that introduction. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for tuning in. So today we are going to be talking about medication-related falls. There are many, many reasons why patients fall. One of these reasons is related to medications. Medications is one of the preventable reasons why people fall, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Unfortunately, it's not always easy to identify if a fall is related to medication. It can be multifactorial, there can be so many different contributing factors, and medications may only be a part of that puzzle. However, if you have had a fall in the last year, or if you are prone to near falls, then having a medication review as part of a comprehensive falls risk assessment is a recommendation. Especially if you're on four or more medications, this increases your risk of falling. So we, before we move forward, I would like to take a moment as well just to clarify that the information I'm sharing today is for educational purposes, that I am by no means trying to provide treatment advice. And this is particularly important because medications are prescribed for a variety of different reasons. They have risks and they have benefits. And so I want to be very clear that the, we are going to be talking about some high risk medications. These high risk medications, although they do increase the risk of falls, can have some very important um, role to play in terms of managing our chronic illness as well. As you heard Julie say in the introduction, one in three adults over the age of 65 are likely to fall in any given year. Adding a high risk medication can double this, this risk. If I were to take this medication and tell you that it would double your risk of falling this year, would you take it? Probably not. Think twice. <laughs> you might think twice. But what if I were to tell you that this medication Without it, you are at an 80% risk of having a stroke this year. With it, your risk of having a stroke was cut in half. However, your risk of falling is doubled. Would you take it then? Some people may, some people may not. It's an individualized approach to prescribing, and so too is it to de-prescribing. So when we're looking at whether or not we should take a medication or not, we should always be looking at the risks and the benefits and making a personal decision about what's what you're looking for in terms of your treatment. Today, we are going to be looking at how to recognize medications that can lead to falls. We'll be looking at how to determine whether or not you're at risk of a medication-related fall. We'll look at understanding the steps that you can take to reduce your risk of a medication-related fall. And I'll also hope that when you walk away today, you'll have a better understanding of the role of your pharmacist in helping to prevent medication-related falls. How do medications contribute to falls? There are many, many different ways. Side effects of medications 
can be many, and some of them are listed here. Some medications can cause low blood pressure. Some of these medications are used to treat high blood pressure. Some of them are used for other reasons and can still cause your blood pressure to drop. This includes orthostatic hypotension, which is a significant drop in your blood pressure from getting from sitting or laying to standing. Some of them cause drowsiness or sedation, which can make us more prone to falling. Some reduce heart rate, and we'll look at how a reduced heart rate can increase our risk of fall as well. Some will cause cognitive impairment or confusion. Others will slow reaction time so that if we are having a near fall, we may be less likely to be able to brace ourselves and prevent that fall. Some impair doubt balance, others cause dizziness, some reduce physical function, and others will cause muscle weakness. So let's take a look a little more in depth at some of those. Medications that are considered a high risk of falls include blood pressure medications, and these medications would include things like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, diuretics. Other medication classes that increase the risk of falls are pain medications, and these can include anything from opioids to anti-inflammatories and anticonvulsants such as Lyrica or Gabapentin. Psychotropic medications, which mean our antidepressants, our antipsychotics, our sedatives, and our benzodiazepines. Medications that are used to treat Parkinson's disease. Anticholinergic medications, and I'll talk to you a little, a little bit about what those are. Insulin, and of course we can't forget alcohol. Even though it's not a prescribed medication, alcohol is one of the leading contributors to falls in the elderly. Blood pressure medications. So as I mentioned before, beta blockers, so that would be, the common ones would be things like bisoprolol, metoprolol, or atenolol, they all end in lol. ACE inhibitors, which end in pril, so ramipril. ARBs, so things like uh, candesartan, they all end in sartan. Diuretics, and, and alpha blockers. So all of these medications can cause orthostatic hypotension. They can cause, some of them can cause dehydration, so specifically our diuretics or other, otherwise known as water pills. And bradycardia, or a slow heart rate. In order to stay upright and conscious, we need a significant amount of blood flow to the brain. If that blood flow to the brain is compromised by a low blood pressure, this is how we develop orthostatic hypotension or, and falls. Pain medications. Opioids can cause confusion, so opioids are things like codeine and morphine, hydromorphone, fentanyl. They cause drowsiness and delayed reaction time. Muscle relaxants that can be by prescription or over the counter, so our uh, methocarbamol is found over the counter in things like robaxacet, or our flexorel, which is a prescription medication, can cause confusion, drowsiness, and reduced muscle tone. Anticonvulsants can cause confusion, drowsiness, and blurred vision, so these are things like Lyrica and Gabapentin. NSAIDs can affect our balance, so NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and include things like naproxen, ibuprofen, and prescribed medications would include things like Celebrex or Mobicox, Meloxicam. Antidepressants can cause confusion, drowsiness, balance and orthostatic hypotension, and many antidepressants are used for pain control. Things like amitriptyline or, or tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, Cymbalta is another one. And so those medications we have to be aware can also be increasing our risk of falls. It can become complicated because pain can also increase our risk of falling. And so the goal is to have adequate pain relief by using the medications the least likely to cause harm with regards to falls or other side effects. Our psychotropic medications. So antidepressants. Antidepressants can cause a variety of side effects as well. And one of those is hyponatremia. And what hyponatremia is, is a low sodium level in the blood. And low sodium level in the blood can cause balance concerns. Even small decreases in sodium can cause these balance concerns. And also sodium plays an important role in our bone health. And so when levels of sodium in the blood decrease, so too can the strength of our bones. 
And so while antidepressants can increase the risk of falling due to stability and balance, it can also make us a little more prone to a fracture if we do fall. So there's uh, several risks associated there. Antipsychotics can affect our balance as well and slow reaction time and cause orthostatic hypotension. Benzodiazepines or benzodiazepine-like, so these are our medications that end in PAM, noticing a trend, but lorazepam, temazepam, oxazepam, clonazepam, and then our benzodiazepine-like are things like zopiclone or imovane. These impair balance cause confusion. They have been shown to decrease physical function. They cause drowsiness and delayed reaction time. And so with that array of side effects, it's no wonder they're one of the leading causes of falls in the elderly as well. Benzodiazepines and alcohol have very similar effects with regards to these side effects and so cause falls in very similar ways. If you do have to take one of these medications, if you are on an antidepressant, it's not to say that you shouldn't be. There are risks associated with it. We're looking at what can be done. What can be done if you're on an antidepressant and you know that this could be affecting your bone strength, it could be affecting your risk of falls. We can look at the antidepressant of choice to see is this the best one? Is it working? If it's working, if it's not working as well as we'd like it to, we might be looking at switching it to another medication that is a, a lower risk of falling or a lower risk of affecting the sodium levels in our blood. The other thing is looking at adding. So adding exercises or other therapies that can help with depression. So group physical activity is one example of this and can play an important role in helping to keep us strong and you'll hear a lot about physical activity through this program uh, but it's one of the things that can help to reverse or to prevent some of the side effects that, are, that can occur with antidepressants. Parkinson's medications. So Parkinson's medications can cause orthostatic hypotension, confusion and excessive daytime drowsiness. Some have been known to cause sleepwalking. Not all Parkinson's medications are used only for Parkinson's disease. Some are used for restless leg syndrome. And it's important to note as well that the progression of Parkinson's disease, some of the symptoms are also orthostatic hypotension and falls can be part of the disease progress. And so when we're looking at medications and we're looking at Parkinson's and we're looking at falls, it's really important to differentiate what's a medication side effect versus what's a symptom of the disease because we wouldn't want to actually remove the medications when it's the disease progress. We could be doing more harm than good. Anticholinergic medications. So anticholinergic medications, it's actually a side effect that covers a wide array of, of medications. Particularly, we find these anticholinergic side effects in a lot of our over-the-counter medications. Gravol, Benadryl, which is diphenhydramine, and is found in many antihistamines, cough and cold preparations like NyQuil, um, or sleep aids, and also our muscle relaxants that we spoke about a little bit earlier. Anticholinergic side effects include blurred vision, so dry eyes, drowsiness and confusion, and in this way they contribute to falls. Prescribed medications that are high in anticholinergic activity include medications that are used to treat urinary incontinence, tricyclic antidepressants, and antipsychotics. So insulin. Insulin needs change over time. As we age, our blood sugar targets also change. Aggressive blood sugar targeting, meaning that we're trying to keep our blood sugar under very tight control, has been shown to lead to falls in the elderly. So oftentimes the amount of insulin that we require is decreased as we age. Low blood sugars can increase the risk of falling. Some of the symptoms of low blood sugar being dizziness and confusion, also blurred vision and weakness can all contribute to these falls. Exercising can make your body more sensitive to insulin. So if you're beginning an exercise program, it's important to be aware of what impact that could have on your insulin needs and on your blood sugar. Always being prepared to treat 
an episode of low blood sugar if you're on insulin is extremely important. So carrying your 15 grams of carbohydrates with you, whether that's your glucose tablets or your six lifesavers or three quarters of a cup of juice, and remembering that our blood sugar should be five to drive. So if you're driving and you're, you're participating in exercise activities outside of the home, Always take your blood sugar before and after you exercise. And if you're not at five, maybe give it a little bit of time, perhaps have a, a little bit of a, a snack before leaving to drive home. Alcohol. Alcohol is not a prescribed medication, but it is too important to leave out of the conversation today. Alcohol can impact falls in several ways. It can impact falls both long term and in the short term. So having too many drinks on one occasion can lead to intoxication, poor coordination and balance problems. Over time, alcohol can impact the, the health of our nerves and our nerve endings. And this can cause peripheral neuropathy, which can lead to falls. It can also cause a shrinkage of a part of the brain called the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is extremely important in terms of our our balance and coordination. And so in this way, alcohol over the long term can also have a, a huge impact on our risk of falling. Are you at risk of a medication-related fall? So we reviewed the high-risk medications. If you are on four or more medications, and one of them from this, the last seven that we just spoke about, then you are at risk of a medication-related fall. Or if you have a fear of falling, you're feeling unsteady, or you've had a fall in the last 12 months and you're on four or more medications, that will also increase your risk of falling. So how can we reduce this risk? An annual review of your medications can help to reduce your risk of a medication-related fall. As we mentioned earlier, there are several things that change over time, and our needs for certain medications change over time as well, which is the important part about having that annual medication review. The other piece that's important with this annual medication review, to have a list of your medications and keeping an up-to-date list of medications that you can share with your providers. Knowing what you take, how much you take, and when you take it is very important. This list should also include any over-the-counter medications or herbals that you take as various interactions can occur. And so and one medication on its own might not increase the risk of falling, but two medications combined together could have that impact. So this list, this medication list, it should include the name and the strength of the medication that you're taking, the dose that you take, when you take it, what it's prescribed for, and when you started taking it. I often see people with the back end of the receipt of the prescriptions, and that's good in that it'll tell us what medications are prescribed or what medications you've had filled. The problem with those lists is that they're not always complete. They don't include anything you take over the counter. If you're on a lot of medications, there's only so much space on that sheet and it doesn't show everything. It doesn't tell us what dose you take, if you take one tablet or two and it doesn't tell us what it's being prescribed for. This list should also include any medications that you've stopped taking in the last three months. And this is because sometimes the effects of stopping a medication can impact our risk of various side effects as well, falls being one of them. Reducing your risk of a medication-related fall. So again, more tips to consider is avoid unnecessary medications. If a medication is not helping you, it's been prescribed, but it's not having the, the effect that it was intended to have, then talk to your doctor or the prescribing nurse practitioner about that, um, because what's the point of being on a medication that's not working? Don't save old medications taking expired medications or old medications that have been discontinued. Sometimes if you have a, a cupboard full of them, it can make a medication error more likely to occur. Not to double up on doses. So if you've missed your morning dose of um, your blood pressure medication, for example, and you realize that um, the next morning when you go to take your, your new morning medications, just take one dose. If you take two, that will increase your risk of orthostatic hypertension and uh, having that low blood pressure and fall. 
not to skip doses. Sometimes this is inevitable. We all forget from time to time, but trying to have some procedures in place to help you remember when to take your medications and so that we're not having a sporadic intake of medications. Medication should be timed and taken uh, on a regular basis. Ask questions when you're being prescribed a medication. So if you're being given a medication to treat an illness, ask how long will I need to be on this medication? That will help to guide future discussion regarding medication. It'll help to prevent you from being on too many medications or unnecessary medications long term. Staying strong, so participating in physical activity, doing the other activities that you'll learn about throughout this series in order to maintain physical functioning as well. Keeping yourself as healthy as possible will help to prevent one requiring medications, but the other is helping to prevent the side effects of the medications. And monitor. If you're started on a new medication, monitor its effects. If you're on blood pressure medications, make sure that your blood pressure is being monitored. If you're on medications for diabetes, make sure that your blood sugar is being monitored. If your doctor orders lab work, make sure that you have it done. This could be looking for things like hyponatremia or that low sodium in the blood that can be particularly important. Renal function or kidney function is something else that might be being requested on the, that lab work and medication changes can, medication needs can change drastically depending on kidney function. We'll move on now to the role of a pharmacist in preventing medication related falls. Pharmacists are trained to identify, prevent, and resolve potential drug therapy problems. These problems or drug therapy problems can be condensed into seven different key areas. One is unnecessary drug therapy. Pharmacists can help to identify whether a medication that's been prescribed one, two months ago, or perhaps two or three years ago may not be necessary anymore. One example of this could be something that we use quite often called proton pump inhibitors. Things like Losec or Nexium are often prescribed for reflux or heartburn. And when prescribed for mild to moderate cases of heartburn, most often are only necessary for 8 to 12 weeks, although people often are on them for long, long terms. Proton pump inhibitors can affect the amount of calcium that's absorbed into our body and can therefore increase our risk of fracture if we fall. Sometimes these medications are continued long term because people generally don't have too many notable side effects to them. And so they're just there, they're not doing any harm or so we, not, no harm that we can see. Um, but if it's not necessary, again, we need to look at whether or not that's a, a medication that can be removed from the list. Is it the wrong drug? Is the drug not working? So if it's not working, it's likely the wrong drug. Is the dose too high or too low? So are we not adequately treating or are we dosing too high and causing the next uh, adverse drug reactions? So are we having a lot of stomach complaints from certain medications and that could be adjusted based on either dosing or changing to a different medication? Inappropriate adherence, so if you're having a lot of trouble remembering to take your medications and you're missing more days than you're taking or you're taking doubling up by accident, that can be something that pharmacists can help you to resolve. And whether additional drug therapy is necessary, so for example, you've had a fall, you've had a fracture, perhaps you've never been screened for osteoporosis, and perhaps a medication for osteoporosis is indicated and pharmacists can help to, to work through that with you as well. During a medication review with a pharmacist, and pharmacists can review your medications to identify any high-risk drugs. They can make suggestions to help reduce your risk of medication-related falls. So for example, adjusting the timing of medications, adjusting the dose of medications, removing unnecessary medications, switching to more appropriate medications, managing side effects, optimizing treatment of medical conditions that might lead to falls, and also improving adherence. And so I have a couple of things here today to show you. We have dosettes that patients can fill themselves that can sometimes help with adherence and sometimes just having our medications laid out for us in this weekly format can be really effective for remembering whether we've taken that morning dose. The other thing that can be prepared are these dosettes. 
so most of our pharmacies will prepare dose sets and they just come in weekly compliance packaging and again this can be nice so that it can reduce the amount of medications that we have in our home we get one week supply at a time or two weeks depending and again it, it serves as a nice visual aid to decide whether or not we've taken that medication already what day we're on just making sure that we're on track with our medication adherence And that ends the presentation today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. The question was, is there a cost to customers to have these dosettes prepared? And the answer is yes and no. The best thing to do would be to check with your pharmacy that fills uh, medications. Often the cost that's associated with filling is not an additional cost to the medications themselves, but whereas some people may be used to filling their prescriptions every 100 days and getting a 100 day supply, Dosettes are filled generally on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. And so instead of paying that dispensing fee per prescription every 100 days, you may be paying it every 30 days. And so that can add up if you're on a lot of medications. But I'd suggest talking to your pharmacy to see what they, how, they, how their arrangements are for that, because everyone is a little bit different. <coughs> so the question was, when performing a medication review with a patient if there are suggestions to optimize therapy, uh, whether the patient then has to return to their doctor to have those changes made, or whether that can be done uh, right kind of there and then. So in order to, to answer that, we it would be specific to the patient and to the circumstance. So in some cases, absolutely, the pharmacist would just write a note to the doctor, the doctor would say, yes, I'm okay with that, and it would be done. If there was more monitoring, however, that had to occur, or if there was more of a question being, for example, the, with the proton pump inhibitors, if I were to say, this patient has been on this medication for three years, is it still necessary? That might require a trip back to the doctor just to assess. So what was it initially started for? Um, something that might take a little bit more, or if there's blood work that might have to be done before adjusting a dose. So if I suspected that somebody's thyroid condition wasn't being treated optimally, so I suspected that they needed an increase in their dose of thyroid medication, I wouldn't know that without the blood work. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't order that. That would require a trip back to the doctor. And to be honest, I think that as healthcare providers in general, we don't do a great job of screening alcohol. Um, it's a very important factor, and I think the statistic is about 10% of our elderly patients do suffer from an alcohol-related disorder um, and, or an alcohol misuse disorder. And so we're not doing a, a great job, in my opinion, of identifying that. And I'm not sure, to be honest, of the, all of the different protocols within various community pharmacies. Um, it's probably not something that I myself even ask the question all that often, um, but it should be. Yes. Nope, there are definitely some medications where alcohol has to be avoided, and um, I won't go into the whole list of them right now. <laughs> However, the risk being that there are some medications, if you take them with alcohol, it can cause significant liver impairment. Um, it can affect our liver. Some of them with certain medications can cause, uh, there's antibiotic in particular that when taken with uh, alcohol can cause a very severe reaction in terms of nausea and um, generally feeling unwell. Well, so we always caution patients not to consume alcohol. If somebody has dementia, there is no safe limit to alcohol. So not necessarily the medication, but the disease process that um, would prohibit alcohol consumption. Um, and so again, it really depends, and it depends on patient circumstance as well. We're looking at limiting alcohol to no more than two in any given occasion, and seven drinks, alcoholic drinks per week for the older adult. Yeah. So if they had particular concerns about any of their medications, yes, they can call and they can get a handout on any, on any medication, even if it's not one they're taking, but they want more information about. Thank you, Cora, for that amazing presentation. If you have any questions about your medications, consult with your community pharmacist or your family doctor and ask for a referral to the pharmacist. Thank you very much. It is, our glory is not in never falling, but in rising every time we do. It takes an entire community to prevent a fall. Thank you. For more information about the free, smart, gentle exercise programs in your area, check out the Vaughn Smart website. 
at www.vonsmartexercise.com or contact Smart Program Coordinator Kelly G by phone 519-323-2330 extension 4954 or by email at kelly.gee at von.ca. The preceding program was brought to you by Whiteman TV and Bruce Telecom. The preceding program was brought to you by Whiteman TV and Bruce Telecom. The preceding program was brought to you by Whiteman TV and Bruce Telecom.